Medic podcast. My name's Amy and I'm a junior doctor and running coach with an interest in sports and exercise medicine. On this episode of the Sports Nutrition series, I'm joined by Dr. Richard Allison, a consultant in performance nutrition and clinical dietetics based at the Institute of Sport and Exercise Health in London. On this episode, we discuss the importance of matching energy intake with energy requirements, how to fuel around training sessions, the role of fasted training, and key considerations when following a restricted diet. Hi, Richard, and many thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Would you mind just by starting off and introducing yourself to everyone listening and just sharing a little bit about your your work and also your research background, because I think you've got a PhD, is that right? That's correct. So at the very beginning, before I got into nutrition, I was actually uh, a Royal Marines commando. And there was a lot of focus on the training side of things, but not so much on the, the nutrition side of things. So that's sort of where my interest began in, in nutrition. Uh, I was then given some what I believe to be very good advice early on, which was to uh, study dietetics first, uh, which is what I did with always having the interest of, of going into sports nutrition. Uh, but having a dietetics background has helped me in good stead because if you see athletes or patients who have new uh, clinical conditions, you can also help to address those as well as the, the performance aspect. So I went down the route of uh, a master's in sports nutrition at Loughborough, uh, then the IOC diploma at Lausanne in Switzerland. I then did various jobs working in uh, the Scottish Rugby Union, for example. Uh, and then I moved to Aspatar in Qatar and spent six years there working in their sports orthopedics medical centre. Um, and whilst I was there, I started uh, researching for my PhD on vitamin D and athlete health, because like a lot of the world, there's a high prevalence of vitamin D insufficiency in that population. Uh, and that sparked my interest in, in vitamin D, uh, which has obviously of late become popular again because of the links with with, with COVID. But, but for us researchers in vitamin D, we've always thought it's important. I then, after leaving Aspatar, spent uh, three and a half seasons at Arsenal. Um, and then concurrently set up my own clinic on Tottenham Court, uh, Tottenham Court Road at the uh, Institute of Sports and Exercise Health, where I see a wide range of clients from elite athletes to exercise enthusiasts. Is there a certain population of athletes uh, that you enjoy working with the most or where you feel like getting a good grip on nutrition really makes the biggest difference? Well, classically, um, the what we call the A to B sport athletes. So these are your runners and your cyclists. The the impact of good nutrition is is more obvious to to the athlete, and therefore genuinely you get better buy in uh, than in team sports, where obviously there's a higher element of, of skill and you know unpredictability in terms of your opposition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You get a bigger buy in because of the uh, the impact that nutrition has on performance. And when somebody comes to see you in your clinic at the ISEH, for example, what are the first kind of initial questions that you're asking people or the key important parts that you want to know about their nutrition and their diet before you make your suggestions and, and start to tweak different elements of their diet? So the starting point would be uh, diet history. Um, and as you're probably aware, there's a, there's a number of different methods of, of recording that. Uh, we know there's limitations on dietary recall. Uh, so I typically ask uh, clients to use the photography-based mobile assessment system, which is uh, affectionately known as Snap and Send. So I ask the, the clients or the athlete to photograph every single thing that they consume, food and fluid-wise. Uh, and then from this, I use a, a nutritional analytical software to, to analyze their macro and micronutrient intake. And you tend to get good adherence to that because most people are within a you know, an arm's length of their phone, they're quite happy to take photographs. Uh, there's very little or no weighing involved. Obviously, the more information that uh, an athlete or a client can provide, the more accurate the assessment can be. But that's usually sufficient for me to get a good idea of, of where they are in terms of those uh, nutrients and if they're um, deficient in any of the micronutrients, for example. Um, it also allows me to understand meal timings, particularly if the, the person's taking the, the photograph uh, live as it were, so you get an idea of when they're eating those meals. Uh, as I mentioned, fluid intake as well. I then also would want to know their their training schedule and their energy expenditure. Uh, so that can be done in a in, in a number of different ways. Um, again, it can be done with recall or uh, respective diet, um, training plans. So an athlete might provide this is my training plan for the next week or the next two weeks 
what have you. And from there, we can try to understand what their uh, average daily energy expenditure is and then make the suggestions going forward. Do you find that everyone slips up in the, the same areas? So most people will say under or overestimate how much they're eating or they're all deficient in kind of similar uh, nutrients, or is it really quite varied depending on who you're working with? I would say generally with my client base, it is varied. Typically, people tend to under-report, and that's why the, the snap and send approach is useful for the client as well, because it gives them a record of, of what they had provided they're adherent to it. And and that in itself is a very useful tool. But as I said, it depends on the client. And and I do see clients that will be the the converse of that, where they have uh, borderline disordered eating or even eating disorders. And so they tend to go to the the opposite. And I believe you have a, a special interest in REDS or relative energy deficiency syndrome. Um, in sport so I was just wondering if you'd mind touching on that and also I suppose how how you can assess whether athletes are meeting their nutritional requirements I know you've touched on a little bit of that already but I imagine it must be quite difficult to work out exactly how much uh, energy a a client is expending and trying to match up the the calories that they're kind of sending you in in those photos so how do you um, I guess bring up that topic of conversation manage it and also identify it yourself so for the listeners that may be aren't aware, so relative energy deficiency in sport or REDS is the result of uh, insufficient calorie intake and or excessive exercise expenditure. Um, it was the more comprehensive name for what was formerly known as the female athlete triad. Uh, but then we see that there was, there was more than three areas to it and it can affect males as well as females. So it was, it was almost reclassified, if you like. And essentially, athletes or clients that are, are in long-term low energy availability, which REDS helps to diagnose. The the consequences are negative to a number of the physiological systems, including uh, metabolism, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, cardiovascular, and and physiological health. So having long-term low energy availability is is very detrimental to health. And and what we've seen recently is as a result of, of the first lockdown of a number of non-athletes, so these exercise enthusiasts, using this time that they've now got from being furloughed, et cetera, to then increase their energy expenditure, increase their activity. And we are seeing people who've done that to an extreme degree. So for example, people who've gone from being quintessential gym users, say going to the gym four times a week, to running three hours a day, every day, without a recovery day. And then they present with uh, stress fractures, et cetera, et cetera. So we're seeing an increased number of uh, clients of that in the non-athlete population. And I think there's been um, a greater attention uh, brought to this. There's a, a young researcher called Mark Hudson, who's at um, Loughborough University. He's doing some tremendous work on this at the moment. Um, and I think it's an area that as both clinicians, researchers, uh, sports, nutrition practitioners, we should be more aware of. So in order to diagnose or attempt to diagnose REDS, we need to know energy availability. And this is calculated by subtracting energy expenditure from energy intake and then dividing that by fat-free mass. And this gives us a, a number of calories over the, over the fat-free mass measured as kilocalories over kilograms of fat-free mass. And so if an athlete or client is above 45 kilocalories, um, that's deemed as they've got sufficient energy availability to maintain normal physiological functions and their physical activities or their sporting activities. If the result is below 30 kilocalories, um, then that's a good indication that they haven't got enough energy to maintain normal physiological processes and this compromises overall health. So obviously, in order to uh, address this issue, we also need to obviously have fat-free mass, and this is measured using uh, body composition analysis. So I actually didn't appreciate that there was some calculations that you could do. So I suppose that that feeds in nicely with the photos you get sent in that you can actually make those calculations. In terms of how people might present to you, do they do they typically present feeling like they're not performing at their best or worried that their energy um, intake isn't matching their requirements? Or do people typically not are not really aware that they're not meeting their energy needs? Well, often they're um, internal referrals for me. So they're coming from the MSK docs. 
Um, so they've either got a, a muscular injury, a recurrent muscular injury. Uh, perhaps they've also got a bony injury, maybe a navicular fracture in the foot, for example. Um, but yes, they tend typically report um, prolonged periods of, of fatigue, low energy, low feeling of drive, these sort of symptoms. And, and they're very gradual. They come on over time. So it's not sort of that they wake up one morning feeling completely spent. Um, so it's sort of, as one of their clients said to me, it creeps up on you. Um, and it's only when you make this assessment and draw attention to the fact that they are in low energy availability, then we can start to address the issue. You mentioned that the symptoms come out, come on over time. Is it something that you address over time as well? Or is it possible to kind of increase that energy intake quite quickly? Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any almost negative effects to going from a low energy state to a high energy state rapidly. Uh, again, that's very much down, uh, down to the case by case or individual basis. Often you'll find that uh, an increase of 400 calories a day would take an athlete from below 30 to above 45. So over you know over the course of a day, add an additional 100 grams of carbohydrate into their diet is fairly straightforward, and and this can take an athlete into high or moderate energy availability. Um, and yeah, it takes of course it takes time, and and they need to adhere to that increase in in energy intake for the symptoms to start to. Uh, lesson or accessibly. Perfect. Thank you um, for just clarifying a few things around REDS. Um, that was really useful. So in terms of, say, a, an athlete that isn't having a problem with their energy availability, but is just trying to optimize their nutrition to aid their performance, um, do you have any kind of top tips for how people should be fueling, say, before a session and, and after a session and any maybe go-to meals or, or snacks that you tend to recommend? Yeah. So again, it's Classic um, answer, it obviously depends on, on duration, uh, competition, and also if the athlete or the exercise enthusiast is adopting fasted training. So that's become uh, increasingly popular as the evidence supports it. And a number of athletes are now using fasted training uh, once, twice, or even three times a week uh, during a normal training pattern. The evidence behind this is that training low uh, increases the upregulation of a uh, a protein called PGC1 alpha, which is also known as the master cell regulator. And this faster training, these adaptations can help improve muscle protein synthesis and aerobic capacity. So it is sought after. But the, the key to that is that genuinely after those faster training, there has to be uh, a feed which includes both protein and, and carbohydrate. And that fits in nicely with kind of the standard approach, which is fueling for the work required or periodizing the carbohydrates. So essentially, you look at an athlete's dietary intake, look at their training schedule, and then most of the time, the, the protein intake and the fat intake would remain similar day to day, but their carbohydrate intake would vary depending on the training session that they have that day. So if they've got a big training session or a, uh, a competition, then we'd look to increase the carbohydrate in the 24, 36 hours prior to that event. And that would come with sort of your classic complex carbohydrates. So it could be rices, pastas, grains, et cetera. And then simple carbohydrates such as sugars from sports drinks, gels, or fruits in, in the hour before the competition. That would be a, a very typical strategy. And then during that week, if they've got uh, recovery days or low sessions or technical sessions that require very or expend very little energy, then the carbohydrate intake for those days would be significantly less. Not advocating low carbohydrate, high fat diets or anything like that. It's just about the carbohydrate fueling for the work required. When people talk about carb loading, say they're approaching marathon day on, on a Sunday, for example, and they're going to start carb loading that week, could you just clarify what exactly carb loading means and I guess how, how it should be done properly? Because I think often the typical picture we get in our head is someone having three bowls of pasta the night before, but obviously that's not really how it's supposed to be done. So could you just explain the ideal way to carb load and also why that's so important for longer um, endurance events? So firstly, um, why it's important is that you need the, that carbohydrate for those prolonged activities at the intensity that most people would say be running a, a half marathon or marathon at. So the carbohydrate is stored both in the skeletal muscle and the liver, and those are the stores that, that we use when we're when we're running. So it's important to maximize those stores. However, there was sort of the almost the old way of carb loading was sort of uh, the approach was five, six, seven days of eating, as you put, high 
carbohydrate pasta meals two, three times a day for an entire week. Now we know that that is no longer necessary and that that, that carbohydrate loading, if you like, can be done the, the day before or the day and a half before. And again, sort of the, the caveat to put here is you shouldn't try this for the first time just before a race. You know, these are things any dietary intervention should be tried during training just in case you do have cramping, GI distress, or it, it has an untoward effect. And you'd obviously, you don't want that to happen during your half marathon, marathon, or an important event. So you need to try all of these things prior uh, to an event. But typically what you're looking at is carbohydrates that you would normally eat. So that's, that's an important part. And you tailor it around what an athlete would usually have. So if they're a big pasta eater, then that's fantastic. If they're not really into pasta, but they prefer rice or grains, then utilize those uh, foods as opposed to introducing a, a new food. And as I said, you want to increase the carbohydrates at main meals uh, in the 24, 36 hours prior to event to maximize those, those glycogen stores so that the, the body is fueled and ready to go. And I guess another key nutrient that we hear a lot about is protein as well. And I think, again, the picture we have in our mind is grabbing the, the protein shake within the thir first 30 minutes, say, after a training session or an event to fuel that recovery. Are there any myths around all of this protein intake? How much do we truly need? And is the timing of that protein intake important? Or is it more just that we need to make sure that we have a, a good protein balance within our diet to support our training? So the simple answer there is that protein is important uh, for the endurance athlete. It's important for obviously repairing uh, muscle damage. Um, improving recovery. So it is an important part of any athlete's diet. Now, obviously, the adaptations to training are what sort of influence whether, uh, say, a bodybuilder versus uh, a long-distance runner. Now, of course, their total protein intake would be different, but it's still an important part of a balanced diet. Now, in terms of timing, uh, that is one of the sort of nutritional myths that you often hear, that there's this anabolic window post-training that's you know a few nanoseconds long and if you don't get your protein shake in that window then you've, you've lost all the potential adaptations to training the most important thing is is total protein intake across the the course of, of a day and we know from the research done by luke van loon it's important to have that net protein intake as opposed to the timing now timing is also important but it's not necessarily where you have to have it immediately post-training but as I mentioned in that earlier question, say, for example, if you'd conducted a fasting training session, then it would be ideal to get that protein and carbohydrate in immediately after a training session. And where I see a lot of use of, of protein shakes, for example, is that it's that convenient way to restore energy. If it's mixed with carbohydrates, it's more of a recovery shake, then it's a good time to take directly after a training session. And we know there's some benefits to taking carbohydrate and protein as a co-ingestion after training sessions. So uh, I think in terms of the science where you look at it and say, well, actually, it isn't ever so important to have it immediately after training. In, in the real world, practically, it's, it's a good time to take it because the idea if you're taking it as a protein shake, you're also replacing fluid loss. So it is very popular with athletes for that reason, but also the, the convenience. Yeah, I was going to say protein shakes just kind of uh, are something we can just pack in our bags and it's ready as soon as we need it and also gives us that little bit of fluid as well. So just in terms of ease, it is so convenient and, and make sure that we actually get the, the calories on board afterwards as well, even if it's not the, the perfect meal as such, it's, it's just ease as well, isn't it? And, and there are there are some athletes that I've uh, still work with who are supplement phobic, should we say, you know, they, they want all their nutrition to come from real food and, and they do manage to do that. But it obviously it, it takes more effort um, and more focus to, to have that meal and the, where they schedule their training sessions so that they finish just before a meal time. So it can be done, but it's for, for most people, it just makes more sense in terms of convenience, as, as you mentioned, to have that protein or recovery shake directly after training. You've touched a few times on on faster training, and I was just wondering, are there certain groups that you advocate that for and certain groups that you definitely wouldn't recommend that type of training for? Because obviously, it's, I, I guess there's a little bit of controversy around it, and it's maybe not appropriate for everyone. So who do you kind of recommend should try faster training and what type of benefits um, do you see in those athletes? Yeah, it's, it tends to be more popular in, in the endurance A to B sport athletes, so cyclists, and, and, and runners, but I have used it with team sport events. So I have used it with uh, footballers and, and rugby players. And it's about the scheduling of it and, and becoming used to it as well. So there's a, an element of that, you know, again, 
you're not going to go straight into to a faster training session if that training session happens to be the hardest training session of your week and you, you need to, to build up to it. Um, and there is some good evidence to suggest that taking caffeine prior to those fasted training sessions um, can help with the, the performance of the training session. So sort of um, there, there's this idea that, you know, if you go into a training session fasted, obviously you're not adequately fueled. Maybe your output would be lower than, than normal, which it would be. Um, but as I said, the, the evidence shows that caffeine taken prior to those sessions can, um, you know, increase the output more than if you didn't have the caffeine. So when you have the, the athletes scheduling in their faster training session, then typically we would advise that they take caffeine prior to those sessions. Um, but they can be beneficial to a, a number of sports. As I mentioned in an earlier question, it, it upregulates this, this master cell regulator called PGC1 alpha. So the, the knock on effect of that is increased mTOR, so increased muscle protein synthesis, but also increased aerobic capacity. So it can be useful for a variety of sports. For athletes that say have a restricted diet, so um, they're not necessarily uh, wanting to fast, but they're they're cutting out certain elements from their diet. They may be vegan or on the the keto diet, for example. How do you um, adapt their nutrition plans, and can can they still perform effectively? Are there any limitations as a result of those quite significant restrictions on their diet? And is there anything that you're particularly worried about nutrient wise or or calorie wise as well? So the, I think I'll start with the, the vegan diet as, as that's been quite um, popular recently and I've seen it personally done very well and I've seen it done very poorly. So probably the, the short answer there is um, it depends on how well you adhere to it. Um, and yes, of course, you can meet all your uh, macronutrient needs from a vegan diet. You can follow a, a typical, I guess, um, fueling plan, you know, particularly if you're looking at, say, endurance sports, you know, all the, all the foods we're talking about in terms of complex carbohydrates, they're all uh, vegan or plant-based foods anyway. So there's there's no limitation in what, what can be done. It's just how that individual goes around doing it. Um, and I know as mentioned, I've worked with athletes who have done it very well. They, they start their sort of dietary plan from scratch. So they're not trying to substitute vegetables for meat. They're building the meals from, from scratch, from, from the ground up, if you like, and making sure that they've got you know, a balanced diet for within their nutritional restrictions, if you like. Um, and yeah, and it, and it can be done really well, very well, but I've also seen it done where almost classically someone's seen a, a documentary on Netflix the night before. They've come in and said, that I want to be vegan, and they've just completely got it wrong and they've underfueled. And yeah, that, that is no way to, to go about, you know, following a plant based. Uh, dietary intake so you know it depends on the, the individual but of course it can be done properly in terms of the vegan diet and do you have much experience with uh, athletes on keto diets is that something that people do try and do yes and again it will come down to uh, you know what what is their sport how well do they do it and I think even in the last few years that the research has moved in, and uh, along with the, the popularity of, of keto so a few years ago it would have been that the, the keto diet was not for, for athletes. Uh, perhaps it was for people who were very unwell. There was some evidence in there from, from Don D'Agostino in terms of keto diets and people who were undergoing cancer treatment. And I think that was quite a solid body of evidence there. But in terms of fueling athletes, it was it was shown to be very varied. And I think that's the, the take-home message from there is that the research is now catching up with you know athletes following a ketogenic diet and there is a varied response and some athletes can tolerate it very well and some athletes don't. And I think that the lay term is uh, metabolic flexibility. And this is this idea that, that marries up with the kind of the periodized approach to training that you could spend um, periods of your um, training schedule where you are, have very little carbohydrate intake and you're becoming adapted to ketone uses. And then when it comes to the event, you, you carb up and you're using the carbohydrate for the fuel for, say, a marathon. So there are people that can do that, but often people get it wrong. They feel underfueled and, and they're unable to compete at the, the highest level in their event. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we've spoken a lot, I suppose, about people that are training, competing um, and the athlete population. But I was just wondering if you had any tips, uh, advice or, or comments on patients that are maybe 
coming back from injury or they're recovering from injury and how their nutritional needs might differ? Yeah, so in terms of the injury, there's a, a few solid uh, recommendations. Uh, the first one would be dietary protein intake, and this can come from, again, animal sources, plant-based sources, real food, and or supplementation. But there's a premise of taking that protein every three to four waking hours. And this, or the evidence shows that this increases an individual's muscle protein synthesis, which obviously helps maintain as much of that muscle mass as possible. Uh, because frequently when athletes and exercise enthusiasts are injured, uh, there's the disuse, they're not stimulating the muscle, there's that loss of muscle mass. So protecting that muscle mass through dietary intake may be the only um, option that that person has because they might not be able to train. So it's, that's, a, that's a strong recommendation. The context of that is it may sound relatively easy, but it's quite difficult for, for a lot of people to take 20 to 25 grams of protein every few hours whilst working without uh, the use of nutritional supplements. Again, not advocating its use. This just tends to be the real world approach because it's convenient. Um, other macronutrients to look at um, in terms of omega 3s, so um, fatty acids to help balance that inflammation. So that could be two to three grams of omega 3 a day. Again, typically from supplementation rather than real food, just because you're able to gauge the amount that you're having. Other nutritional strategies are the use of collagen, collagen peptides that have again become uh, increasingly popular over the last few years. And the evidence is, is supporting uh, their use. And there's also now vegan sources of, of collagen. So it's not um, excluding the, the, the plant based athlete. Um, and then on top of that, classic things such as creatine taken correctly to help, you know, again, maintain that, that muscle mass. And then overall, making sure that the, the athlete or the exercise enthusiast doesn't have any nutrient deficiencies. Uh, so we do dietary analysis, make sure that they're not deficient in anything else. Um, Vitamin D supplementation is highly recommended, around 1,000 international units uh, of D3 a day without looking at, at blood results is, is recommended. Um, and then just managing that overall energy intake, which typically, again, is done by managing carbohydrate because the injured person, the injured athlete needs sufficient energy to repair that injury. But obviously, if we have excess energy intake, the, the athlete's going to start gaining fat mass, which they then have to go through the process of, of losing what's there fully fit, returning to train and then returning to play. That was a really interesting. I hadn't actually considered taking uh, omega-3 particularly um, during periods of rest and recovery. Is that something you'd recommend uh, athletes taking anyway if they're kind of training hard and also need to balance the inflammation that can be occurring in the muscles even during training? Or is that something that you primarily focus for those in recovery? So, yes, I would, I would recommend it, um, again, based on dietary intake, maybe maybe a gram of, of omega-3 uh, a day. Um, turmeric is also a good option for those that don't want to have the, the omega-3. Um, omega-3 can also be used as, as in mega doses for those that are experiencing um, severe muscle soreness or, or DOMS delay onset of muscle soreness. So, for example, if you see an athlete the day after a heavy training session and they're reporting high levels of muscle soreness, then those mega doses of omega-3 can help attenuate that soreness. And to clarify what I mean by omega dose, that's typically one gram per kilogram of body weight. So, for example, an 80 kilo athlete would have eight grams of, of omega-3, which I can I can guess is for most people it is quite a lot. It's, it's almost a handful of omega three tablets, but that would only be used in in that situation where they've reported um, unusual amounts of soreness after a race or an event or a heavy training session. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard of that before. Um, thank you so much for for sharing all of that information. Uh, just to wrap up, is there anything that you feel we haven't touched on, or any other uh, comments that you wanted to make about nutrition and, and training in general? I think the, the main thing is uh, people in, in our industry, both credible and, and, and the social media warriors, there seems to be camps that people want to, to set up in, whether it be low carb, high fat, keto, vegan, et cetera. And I just feel that as, as professionals, we should be open to the fact that everyone is, is different. Everyone has different needs. And yes, what we do has to be underpinned by peer reviewed research. But as a practitioner, it's N versus N equals one. 
So you need to look at that person as an individual. And, and often what I've, I've said is um, a number of times in my career, we've been approached by companies that can do genetic testing or claim to do genetic testing. And they talk about how they can do genetic testing for the perfect diet, but also the perfect training um, regimen, for example. Um, and where we had this discussion is that a good training coach, a good S&C coach, in a matter of minutes can make that assessment on someone in a gym of the type of training they need to do, you know, whether they've got a, a high number of fast twitch fibers versus slow twitch fibers, et cetera, et cetera. They can see that pretty quickly. Whereas in nutrition, we don't have that luxury of being able to look at someone and say, you would respond really well to X, Y, or Z diet. So uh, I think we have to be patient and, and the athlete also has to be patient, but we need to listen to them and they sort of need we need that subjective feedback and, and look at what fits different people's lifestyles. So, for example, what has become, again, increasingly popular is intermittent fasting. And, and there's, there's some good evidence for why people should follow intermittent fasting. And there's some evidence to suggest well, actually that's not true or hasn't been shown in the peer-reviewed uh, research yet. But it might just be that that way of eating fits that person's lifestyle the best. Um, and so perhaps skipping breakfast works for them because that's when they train they want to do faster training or they've got a busy lifestyle etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think it's very much about tailoring any dietary intervention to the individual to meet their needs but also based on their lifestyle and what they can manage i think that's really true for nutrition as well because food isn't just purely fuel it's something that we enjoy that it's part of our social lives so appreciating all of those aspects of someone's life is just as important especially if they're you know uh, someone that's enjoying that exercise just for them and they're not at a really high level of competition we've got to obviously factor all of those those parts in as well and, and there's also the, the sort of the other extreme of, of the, the food phobic you know athlete who does look at it purely as, as food um, and therefore you uh, sorry as they look at the food purely as fuel not as food uh, and so there's there's obviously elements there that we need to be careful with when we're addressing uh, athletes and make sure that there aren't underlying um, issues of disordered eating or eating disorders and um, and if they have any red flags that we were prepared and aware and confident enough to refer on if necessary and keep an eye on them because yes food is a social thing and um, unlike other potential vices you can't just completely not eat you know everyone has to eat so depending on their relationship with food it's very important to take that into account as well absolutely um if people are keen to learn more about nutrition and or they want to find more about you and, and come and see you at the ISCH for example uh, is there anywhere that I can direct them to or any sources that you want to share I can be found at, on twitter at, at sport underscore dietitian or on richardallisonnutrition.com, which is a, another easy way to find me. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. A huge thanks to Richard for joining me today and sharing all of that information about sports, nutrition and dietetics. If that sparked your interest and you want to learn more, then you can find Richard on Twitter by searching sport underscore dietitian or by searching Richard Allison Nutrition on Instagram. As he mentioned, you can also visit his website, richardallisonnutrition.com. I'll be back next week with an episode on gut health, and you can keep up to date by visiting marathonmedic.com or searching marathonmedic on Instagram. Thanks so much for listening.